Adams Point. How are we doing this morning? We feeling alive? Why don't we stand and we praise and thank our God this morning with this new song we're going to sing for you, all right? Come on, we sing. Walking into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. Just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. And just when I ran out of the road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me that I was not alone. Come on, you sing with me. He picked me up and he turned me. Solid right. 
out to him.
Good morning, and I'm so glad to be here with you guys. Man, it was so good to spend some time in the presence of God, just worshiping Him. And it, honestly, it's great to be in the presence of you guys. I love you guys. I love being here with you guys. I had a chance to meet a few people today um, who are now in this service who have never been here before. And so I know there's some guests who, are, who have never been here. Maybe you're new here. Church, would you give it up for them? We're so glad you guys are here. Man. Now, you know what I would love to do is I'd love to get you a gift into your hands. The easiest way for us to do that is just right outside those doors at a place called Connection Point right out there in the lobby. Right after this service, just let them know, hey, we're new here, and we'll get you a gift. Just our way of saying thank you for being here. If you brought somebody, take them up there and introduce them and get them their gift, all right? We're just so glad you guys are here. We are at the very beginning of this awesome, incredible new series. It's called How to Not Be Your Own Worst Enemy. Now, We've been talking about how sometimes bad things just happen in our lives. You know, it's not our fault, but we just have to deal with it. But oftentimes, when the bad things happen in our lives, many of us can look back and go, well, it kind of happened because of a stupid thing that I did. You know, sometimes we're our own worst enemy. So we're talking about how it is that we can not be that way, how it is that we can look at God's Word, and maybe God's Word has something to tell us about how we could live our lives in a way that we would not be our, our own worst enemies. Now, I don't know if you can relate to me, but I'm so glad that I grew up in the 1970s and 80s, and I did so many stupid things, but there's no record of it anywhere. It's awesome. I feel sorry for you kids growing up today where everything is recorded. But you know what? Um, I think sometimes if I were to have, maybe, I think this would be cool. If I were to be doing something and doing something stupid, like I'm prone to do, and maybe God would just like freeze it and just go, hey, uh, Tom, you're about to do something stupid. Let's think about the ramifications of what it is that you're about to do. Kind of like when you're, you're, you see these videos of these guys like on skateboards, right? And they're going down like these half pipe things and, and things like that. You guys have all seen something like that, right? And you're like, you know what's about to happen to this guy. You know that what he's doing is not smart. In fact, let's take a, let's play a little game here, okay? Show of hands, audience participation, you can talk amongst yourselves, and big raise of hands, okay? How many of you think you know what's about to happen next? Let, let's say this. Do you think that this guy sticks the landing? Who thinks he sticks the landing? Like three of you. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. How many of you think that he breaks his skateboard in half? Okay, a few of you, very good. How many of you think that he just crashes and breaks a bone, probably breaks his arm or whatever? Okay, the majority of you. You guys are hoping he crashes. I know you, I know you. Okay, well, let's see, what happens next? Oh, he sticks the landing, wow. Okay, I mean, that dude is super lucky. That dude is super lucky. He did not get what he actually deserved. Hey, sometimes, it's our own stupidity. Sometimes we invite friends into our stupidity. Like this guy right here, he thought it'd be a good idea to, you know, have his friend hop down on the ball and, and, and you know, and pop the ball, uh, the blue ball, the, the one, you know, the, that one. And, and um, um, <laughs> uh, so, so the question is, what happens next? Do you think that the, the, the bicycle is going to try and he's just going to fall off and just fall backwards? Or do you think he's going to land on his friend and really hurt his friend? Or do you think he actually pops the ball? Who thinks he's going to fall backwards? Who thinks he's going to land on his friend? Who thinks he's going to actually pop the ball? 
Okay, you guys, positive thinkers, I like this. Let's see what happens next. Oh! Oh, wow. Okay, that was close. All right. Okay, so sometimes it's not you. Sometimes it's your stupidity is just the friends that you have, honestly, because maybe you've had this where people are playing a prank on you. Like this poor guy in the office right here, his friends are going to play a prank on him. And what do you think the prank is? Is someone going to jump out to scare him and he's gonna, his stuff's going to fly all over? Who thinks that's going to happen? Anyone? Okay, yes, good. How many of you think that somebody's just going to give him an inappropriately hard high five? Okay, okay. How many of you think he's gonna, someone's going to roll a skateboard out and he's going to trip and slip and go crazy? Okay, you guys got it? All right, what happens next? Oh, it's the inappropriately hard high five. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, some of you have seen that show. I won't tell you what show that is because I can't say that from stage on church. Okay, last one, okay? Now, sometimes it's just everything just kind of works out not very well for you. Like these guys, we're at church here. There's a band, a worship band. They're going, doing their stuff. They're worshiping God. Everything's going fine until something happens. How many of you think the cross is going to fall down? Okay, how many of you think the drummer's cage is going to collapse on him? All right, and how many of you think the band is just going to stop playing and just awkwardly just kind of stand around and look at people? Okay, all right, what, what, what happens next? It's all the above. You guys are all winners. You guys all nailed it. Yes. Man, sometimes things like that just happen. Sometimes it's our own fault, and that's what we're talking about this week. And so we're so glad you guys are a part of this. And I just do want to say that we have started up a bunch of new groups and things like that. And you might think, well, it's too late for me to get into one of those groups. But I want to tell you this, it's not. My group has just been having an amazing time digging through this stuff, uh, reading through the daily devotionals and things like that. And so I just want to encourage you, whether you're new here or whether you've been here for a long time, if you're not in a group. It's not too late. You can still sign up for one. You can still be going through this stuff together with some people. And I guarantee you, it will really have an impact and a change in your life. You could do that through the QR code that's behind me, or you could go out again to Connection Point and just tell them, hey, I would still like to be in a group. What they'll do is they will get you into a group that fits you, that fits your time, that fits who you are and where you are in life. So just an encouragement. Do that. Make sure you're not alone during this time. Last thing I just want to say also is just so grateful for all of you and for this church because you guys have really been making a huge difference out in the community. Whether you know it or not, there's groups of people at Vantage Point Church constantly doing stuff out in our community, out with our partners that we're partnering with um, to help all sorts of people and to be living proof of a loving God. And so if you've missed out on some of those opportunities, we got an opportunity for you that's super simple. It's one of the easiest things you can do, and that is that we go out periodically and we're doing it on Saturday, we're going to go out and clean the streets, okay? We have actually adopted part of the city of Eastvale, a street, and so we're going to go out there and we're going to clean trash, pick up trash, pit, pull weeds and stuff like that. Not only is it awesome because we're all wearing our Vantage Point shirts and people drive by and they honk at us and they see that Vantage Point cares about the community, but it's also something that we all, all, always find a chance to share God's love and to share the gospel with somebody, and also we just get to know people. So I just really encourage you, again, go out to Connection Point, let know. Hey, I would love to be a part of that. That's this Saturday, and we're going to be cleaning up the streets. And thank you for those of you who are a part of giving and helping this church do ministry uh, the way we do, whether it's ministry here on Sundays or it's ministry outside these walls. We could not do it without you, and so thank you for being a part of that. If you have not yet had a chance to be a part of that and to be a part of what God is doing, I want to just encourage you to, to, you know, take this time to just go, okay, God, I want to be a part of something, and I am willing to give a little bit of what you've given to me back to you so that you could use it and you could use me. And the easiest way for you to do that is really online. 
Uh, you can do it several ways. You can go to our website at vantagepointchurch.org, and you can sign up to give. You could you could text right now here in service. You could just text Vantage Point to seven seven nine seven seven, and you could give. You can also do it the old fashioned way in the box out there. Um, we love it when you even set up recurring and consistent giving because it's easy for you. And uh, it really is a way that God can just use you and bless people through you. So thanks for being a part of that. We're Again, we're in a brand new series called How to Not Be Your Own Worst Enemy. Pastor Mark is going to bring it. It's going to be an amazing message. I can't wait for you guys to hear it right before he comes out. Let's watch this together. Thanks for being here, you guys. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to week two of our fall spiritual growth campaign, everybody. So glad that you guys are here. Hey, one of the things, too, about this series is, man, we have been praying about this ever since the beginning of the summer. And one of the things that we've been praying about is that God would take us from 50 to 100 groups. And I am proud to announce that we, uh, that God has taken us from 50 to 170 groups during this time. So come on. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know about you guys, but maybe you're relatively new to Vantage Point. Maybe you kind of feel like you hear stories about the very beginning of our church, and you, maybe you feel like you kind of missed out. I really feel like this has been probably the most exciting uh, time at our church. So I'm just super glad that you guys are here right now. Okay, I want to tell you about something. I want to tell you about the best thing that I've ever done. I want to tell you about the worst thing that I've ever done all at the same time. My wife and I, when we started dating, man, I, I, I laid eyes on this little girl named Andrea Karish, and I just knew that I was in love, okay? And do you know how I knew that I was in love with her? Because we didn't just TikTok each other. You know, we, we didn't just snap each other, but we did this thing. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. It's called talking on the phone with each other. And in fact, we would talk with each other on the phone so long. Anybody, anybody remember this? Like our ears would get sweaty. And it, our ears would get nasty. And it would, like our ears would start to hurt. I mean, it would be like 3 o'clock in the morning. I got to go to class in a couple hours. And I'm like, sweetie, I got to get off the phone. And then Andrea would say this, well, you get off the phone first. Remember that? <laughs> you get off the phone first. And I was like, girl, uh-uh, you get off the phone first. And she was like, no, you get off the phone first. And then I got this great idea. I said, okay, well, why don't we get off the phone at the same time, right? And we'll count to three. One, two, three. You still there? <laughs> you yeah, uh, we had the perfect, there was a book called I Kiss Dating Goodbye during that time. 
And we kissed dating goodbye, so much so that we didn't even kiss until we got engaged. Do you know that? I mean, except for that one time. You know, that one time got pretty ugly. But besides that, didn't even kiss until we got engaged. Oftentimes people ask, Andrea, did you know that you were going to marry a pastor? Because I was uh, working as an engineer at the time. Um, when I first asked Andrea to be my girlfriend, I said, uh, Andrea, now I don't know if I'm going to be an engineer forever because I think maybe God has called me to be a pastor, which is like, what a great Christian pickup line. You know what I'm saying? That's, al that's almost like saying, I'm going on missions and I may never be back. Um, and do you know what Andrea said to me in that moment? She said, oh, that's great because I've always wanted to be a pastor's wife. So, let's fast forward a couple years later. Uh, we've moved to California. Andrea is working as a teacher so that she can support my way through cemetery, I mean seminary. <laughs> and I have this opportunity to speak at a big youth camp, and uh, this would be the first time that Andrea would have never heard me speak. And I'm like, honey, you're going to come, right? She's like, I can. I got grading. I got lesson planning. I got all this stuff to do. I was like, but come on. This would be the first time that you never heard me speak. She's like, no, I can't go. I'm so tired. I was like, you got to go. She's like, I can't go. And in a moment of selfishness and brokenness, do you know what I said to my wife after our first year of marriage? I looked at her and I said, you know what? You've never supported me. You don't have to react so bad. <laughs> okay? It really wasn't that bad. No, it was. It was. And you know this. You know this. But so many times we have a tendency to think that my worst enemy is somebody else. That my worst enemy is my spouse, that my worst enemy is my boss, that my worst enemy is my teacher, that my worst enemy is all of these things. But here's the thing. If you and I could just solve me, then I think we'd be in a much better position than we are in right now. Here's a quick question I want to ask you, and that's this question right here. What is the common denominator between every bad decision that I have ever made? Anybody know? It's me! I was not only there at every bad decision, I participated in every bad decision. I have talked myself into things. I have talked myself out of things. I have bullied myself. I have begged myself to do certain things that at the time that I thought were the best decisions that man could possibly ever make, only to realize that I was actually the stupidest person who had ever lived in the entire world. Like, I have talked myself out of going to the gym. I have talked myself into eating multiple desserts on a different night. I have talked myself into blowing up at the children, thinking, you know, I mean, these kids, they've got to learn somehow. Uh, you and I, we have bought cars, we have bought houses, we have skipped meetings, we have called in sick from work, we have done uh, home renovations that were maybe a little bit more expensive than we ever anticipated that they would be. We've talked ourselves into all, uh, saying that there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's really no big deal. When in actuality, when you and I look under the hood, you and I come to see that, you know what? Maybe the problem is me. And so that's part of the reason why we've started this series called How to Not Be Your Own Worst Enemy. And if you, uh, if you read your devotional this week, I, I, I absolutely love what it was that Matt was talking about because Matt in his testimony said this, I'm looking in the mirror and I'm seeing broken things and I'm seeing all these different cracks, right? You and I see the same thing. Every time that internal voice goes, you know what, what were you thinking? Like, you're so stupid. He says, every time I see those things, I see those things, I see the brokenness, I see the cracks, but he says this, but now I'm able to look through that and past that and see the person that God is wanting me to be. I love what he says because he's saying this, that as much as I hear that voice in my head, here's what I've realized, that I can silence that voice. And I have power over that voice. And I am not a victim to that voice voice. And so today what I want to do is I want to talk to you about the Apostle Paul's inner voice. 
And how it is that the Apostle Paul deals with that inner voice that exists with inside of him. And so if you, ever, if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, what you're going to find is that in a divine stroke of karma, there, maybe there's a better way to put that, in a divine stroke of uh, of, of godly providence, what we find is that ironically, the same person who had been killing Christians and persecuting the church is now being persecuted for the church. The Bible tells us that he has been flogged for his faith. The Bible tells us that he has been beaten for his faith, that he has been stoned for his faith. And we're not talking about the legal kind. We're talking about stoned with rocks, which would be like God. Why is this happening to me? In fact, as he's writing this letter, Paul has been in Roman custody for the past four years. And in the fourth year, we find him writing this letter, but we find him writing this letter in a tone that I wouldn't necessarily expect. Do you know why? Because the Apostle Paul is going to tell us about how happy he is. He's going to tell us about how joyful he is. If you know anything about the Bible, the book of Philippians is essentially the book that is written that's all about joy. The Apostle Paul isn't going to tell us about the, how, how, how his glass is half full. The Apostle Paul is about to tell us how his glass is all full. And he says this in Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 6. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers with all of you, I always pray with what? With joy. Can I just time out for a second? Like, I don't get enough opportunities to tell you guys, like, how, just how blessed I am to be your pastor. I just love you guys. I love being here. And I want you to know... That man, it, it, it's such a joy for us to be able to do all of this together. Anyway, that's a total side note. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Maybe some of you have heard this verse before. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I love what the Apostle Paul is saying because he's saying that I have this amazing depth of confidence. And he's saying that my amazing depth of confidence, that it comes from this place where I know that God isn't just a good starter. I don't know if you know this about me. I'm a good starter. I'm just not a very good finisher. Like, I'm really good at starting home improvement projects. I'm really bad at finishing home improvement projects. I'm really, <laughs> I'm really good at starting to mow the lawn I'm just really bad at finishing mowing the lawn. I'm really good at starting my day with parenting. I'm really, really also good at going, hey, could you tuck the kids in tonight? You know, could you make sure you, uh, could you like do bath time tonight? Um, here's the great thing about God, that God isn't just a good starter, that God is an even better finisher. And I want you to think about, as it relates to your life, the things that you get frustrated with, if God has started a work inside of you, let me tell you this, God is going to finish what it is that he started. Let's go ahead and look at the next verse, because, I, I mean, not the next verse, but verse 12, because verse 12, Paul goes on to say this, now I want you to know something, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. That what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now, as a good Bible reader, one of the things that you have to ask is, well, what's happened? Like, what's happened to Paul during this time? Let me tell you what Paul wanted to have happen. What Paul wanted to have happen, Paul's hopes and Paul's dreams, is that what he wanted to do is he wanted to go to Rome, which was considered the capital of the world. He wanted to preach the gospel to Nero, who was considered the most powerful person in the world. And his idea was this, man, I'm dreaming big. Like, I got, you know, I'm going to climb spiritual Mount Everest right now. I'm going to do an ultra marathon. I'm going straight into the, into, the, into the depths of Mordor with the ring, and I'm going to throw it into the volcano, and then somebody's going to jump on my back and eat my finger, and it's going to be amazing. And yet, what we find is that sometimes there is a gap between what it is that we expect out of life and what it is that we experience. My, my, my wife would say that after we got married. 
that there was a difference between what she expected in marrying a pastor, okay, and what she experienced in marrying a pastor. And maybe you've experienced the same thing. The Apostle Paul, that's what he was expecting. You know what he experienced? He was illegally arrested in Jerusalem. He was misrepresented in court. He was incorrectly identified as an Egyptian terrorist. He shipped across the Mediterranean Sea where he also ended up being shipwrecked. He's like floating on this thing. Like snake bites him. Like that would be enough for me. This whole snake thing, you know? And here's what, you, like the, the Apostle Paul, who is the Apostle Paul? He's like the greatest Christian ever right? He's the greatest evangelist, maybe the greatest church planter that the world has ever seen. Do you know where he should be? He should be filling harvest crusades with, you know, stadiums full of people. He should be in his YouTube studio talking to his 30 million YouTube subscribers is where he should be. And yet, you know where, he find, where we find him? We find him forgotten about in Roman custody for four years, okay? So what do you do in a situation like that? What do you do when there's a gap between what it is that you expected and what it is that you're experiencing? What do you do when you have a dream and it seems as though God has crushed that dream? What do you do in that situation where it seems like in your head, you just want to be your own worst enemy. Well, he goes on and it says this in verse 13. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace garden to everyone else that I am in chains. Why? For Christ. That I am in this dead end job for, for Christ. That I am going through these health problems for Christ. That my children may have these issues for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Here's what I love. Here's what I love. Paul's sitting in a prison, not quite where he should be. And yet the most surprising thing to me is that he ain't sitting here licking his wounds. He's not throwing himself a pity party. You know what he says? He says that I'm glad. He says that I'm happy. Do you know why he's happy? Because the circumstances and the trials and the hardships that he's gone through, that even though it's not quite what he's expecting, that it's actually paved a way to advance the gospel. That's what he's saying, right? That although this isn't my will, this is God's will. And sometimes what we find is that God has an even better plan than I do. That word advance in the Greek has been known to be used to refer to lumberjacks or tree cutters that would go in advance of a Roman army and pave the way for that army to go through. And this is what the Apostle Paul is saying, that these chains, that although I didn't, that I would not have written my story this way, here's what my chains have done, that they have actually paved a way for the gospel that I never, ever would have expected. And when we talk about chains, you know what we're talking about? We're talking about actual chains. We're talking about the fact that he's got chains around his wrists. He's got chains around his feet. He's got chains around his neck. He is chained to four different Roman guards six hours a day where he's got no privacy and he's got no freedom at all. But you know what the Apostle Paul does? He does this. He looks at his chains. He looks at the guard. He looks at his chains. He looks at the guard. He looks at the chains, he looks at his guard, and he goes, who's the captive now? Because in this moment, what he's thinking is this, that maybe I can't preach the gospel to one most powerful person in all of Rome. And so, you know what God's will must be? God's will must be for me to preach the gospel to all of these different, a plethora, a myriad, I don't know how many, like a whole bunch of, a whole bunch of powerful people in Rome. And guess what? 
I'm not the captor, a captive anymore. I got a captive audience. And so he preaches the gospel over and over and over and over to these Roman guards who come through. You know what the Apostle Paul is doing? He's not looking for the tragedy. He's looking for the opportunity. He's not looking for how God isn't working. He's looking for how God might be working. He's not looking for the bad in a situation. He's looking for the good. Because last time I heard, God works all things for the good of those who love him. And you know what? You know why we need to talk about this right now? Because I feel like for the past couple years, not only have we gone through a global pandemic, but we have also gone through a global pandemic of negativity. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree with that? Like, it's like, politics this, and Target bathrooms that. And, and has anybody heard of something called the Next Door app? Next Door app? That is, that was, in case you didn't know, that was created by the devil himself. Because if you ever go on the next door app, your next door neighbors are going to put like, oh, there are teenagers outside. <laughs> what are these teenagers doing? And you're like, oh, I didn't realize I moved to such a gang infested area. <laughs> and then you look out the window and you go, sure enough, there are, oh, those are my children. <laughs> those are my children they're talking about. I, I, I wasn't going to talk about this, but, uh, you know, uh, like, Pastor Rick Warren, when his, when his own child, who was struggling with mental health issues, ended up taking his own life, I was just amazed. I was shocked at the capacity that people have to just be evil and mean and nasty to somebody who's going through uh, maybe what might be the the worst situation of his life, right? I, th I, th I think it's kind of strange because as somebody who was born in this country, as somebody who constantly tries to activate and exercise my, my positivity muscles, it's not a disposition and it's not a personality, right? It's something that we have to exercise. It's something that we have to get good at. We have to get good at this. But I'm just surprised sometimes by some people in our country who, listen to me, who only want to see the bad things about our country. You know, now, like, I want to time out for a second just because, like, is our country perfect? Absolutely not. Do we need to gloss over some of the mistakes that we've made? Absolutely not. When, if, if I have somebody who has been sexually assaulted, the last thing I'm going to do uh, to tell that person is this, that you know what? You just need to get over it. But at the same time, like this country is where I live. This country is my home. And so what I'm not gonna do to my home is I'm not gonna throw trash all over my home. And here's the thing, not only do I try and do that with my country, but I also try and do that with my state. Because can I ask you this? Is California perfect? Someone say no. All you have to do is go downtown in order to know that. <laughs> but at the same time, can I ask you this? Could there be a purpose why you're here? Could there be a reason why God, at the moment, still has you right here? Because it is true that Los Angeles is one of the most influential places in the world right? As goes Los Angeles, go, so, so goes the country. As goes the country, so goes the world. And if you and I can be the salt and the light where God has put us right here, imagine what it is that God might be able to do. There's a famous, famous missionary named C.T. Studd, who, by the way, that would be an amazing name to have. <laughs> And he, he's known to say this, some wish to live within the sound of a chapel bell. I want to run a rescue mission five feet from the gates of hell. Now, I'm not saying California is hell, you know, because if you got the Beachcomber Cafe in Newport Beach, like how, how bad can it be, honestly, you know? 
All I'm trying to say is this. What's true of your state is also true of your family. What's true of your state is also true of your children. I, I, I heard this just recently. Um, Andrew and I had the opportunity to have dinner with another ministry couple last week, and they said something that we wrote down that we absolutely loved. They said, at some point, we changed our parenting, and instead of telling them who we didn't want them to become, we started telling them who we did want them to become. You know, that's not negative parenting. That's positive parenting right? I love what the Apostle Paul says at the end of Philippians because he says this right here, one of my favorite verses in the entire, entire Bible. He says, finally, my brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy about your boss, about your workplace, about your professor, about your staff. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to focus on those things. I want you to make sure that those things are right dead center in your vision. Uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I was driving on the highway one time, and one time I was driving behind this truck, and this truck had stuff piled up on the truck. It looked like two stories high. Have you ever seen that? It was almost like something out of a Dr. Seuss book. Little truck, lots of stuff. Looked like it was all tied together with fourth grade girl hair ties, by the way. Okay? And as I'm driving behind this truck, a dishwasher falls off from the back of the truck. Okay? Not a good thing, right? But this is what I find happening. I keep wanting to look at the dishwasher. And as I keep looking at the dishwasher, what happens? I keep steering towards the dishwasher. As I keep looking at the dishwasher, the dishwasher keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And what do I have to tell myself? I have to tell myself, don't look at the dishwasher. Don't look at the problem because as I look at the problem, I'm going to steer towards the problem. As I look at the problem, the problem is going to continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Here's what I must do. I must focus on what is right, what is lovely, what is pure, whatever is admirable. If, excel if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, here's what I have to do. I have to go ahead and focus on those th things. Do you know why? It's because of this principle right here. You will find whatever you focus on. Think about your eyesight for a second. Your eyesight can only focus on one thing. And you can either focus on the bad and then every other blessing in your life can go out of perspective and out into your peripheral vision where it's nothing but a blurry cloud, right? If you want to look for the bad, guess what? You don't even have to try. The bad's going to find you. But the good is something so completely different because you have to use effort. You have to use strength. You have to focus. You've got to do something about it. I love what the devotional this week said. The devotional uh, for this past week, it said this, that every day you and I have about 50 to 70,000 thoughts in our head. 50 to 70,000 thoughts about your office, about your boss, about your marriage, about your professor. Y'all got 50 to 70,000 thoughts and 90 percent of them are negative, okay? You know what that means? That means this, that you and I must capture them. You and I must captivate them. You and I must realign them, and you and I must readjust them. Do you know why? It's because of this right here, that my 
that your thoughts have incredible power and you have an incredible power over your thoughts. Let's say that together except for in the first person, okay? That my thoughts, say it with me, have incredible power and I have an incredible power over my thoughts, right? Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says this, that you and I are not to conform to the pattern of this world, but we are to be transformed. That you and I are to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. The Bible says that the enemy has come to kill and to steal and to destroy, but Jesus has come so that you might have life and so that you might have life to its fullest. I love what author Paul Tripp says because he says this right here, that no one is more influential in your life than you because no one talks to you more than you, right? No one talks to you more than you. And if no one is going to talk to you more than you, here's what you need to say, that I need to see the good in people that I'm going to be kind and I'm going to be patient and I'm going to be gracious, okay? Because whatever you fix on, whatever you focus on, that is what you're gonna end up finding. And instead of saying, you know what? My husband is driving me crazy. Why did we have all these children and this stupid car, this? You know what you're gonna say instead? You're gonna say, you're going to capture those thoughts and you're going to say, I got a lot going on today, but you know what? I would rather be busy than unemployed. What you're going to say is this, you know that we have a lot of kids, <laughs> but you know, given the fact that the next generation is leaving Christ in droves, man, we have the opportunity to invest in the next generation. Here's what I think. I think that the past couple years have been like a pot of boiling water. You throw anything in a pot of boiling water, guess what? It's going to change. You cannot be in a pot of boiling water and not change at all. And I think uh, if you throw a carrot into boiling water, what's going to happen? It's going to start hard, but then after a while, it's going to lose its strength. And for some of you, that's what the past couple of years have done for you. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you've lost a marriage. But here's the thing, you didn't only lose those things. You know what you lost? You lost your hope. You lost your spirit. You lost your strength during that time. Um, what happens when you throw an egg into boiling water? When you throw an egg into boiling water, it's kind of soft on the inside, but then after a while, it kind of hardens up. And for maybe for you, you're in law enforcement. Maybe for you, you're... Uh, You've kind of followed a lot of the politics and the only defense that you feel like that you have in this moment is uh, to get bitter and to get angry and to get resentful. But let me ask you this. What happens when you throw a coffee bean into boiling water? When you throw a coffee bean into boiling water, you know what you're going to get? You're going to get liquid gold <laughs> is what you're going to get, okay? Okay. Uh, what you find is that you don't even have to grind up those coffee beans. You can just put coffee beans right into the water and enough time is going to happen. What you're going to find is that the coffee bean isn't going to be impacted by its surroundings as much as that coffee bean, that very thing, will be the thing that transforms everything around it. And could that be God's will for you today? And could it be God's will for me today? That yes, that there is a gap between what you expected out of life and what it is that you're experiencing. Yes, could it be that you are disappointed with someone or something right now, but could it also be that maybe what God wants to do in your life right now is that maybe God wants to turn that mess into a message. Maybe God wants to turn that test into a testimony. Maybe God wants to turn that hurt into hope, but Here's the thing. You've got to be able to do that right here. And it starts with what we talked about last week, which is we've got to get into God's word, right? It's the truth of God's word that 
not only expels those lies, but it's what we're talking about today that's the application of that, right? You've got to apply that to your life. You've got to apply that to you. Zig Ziglar once said this, it's your attitude that determines your altitude. You know how the Bible puts it? The Bible puts it like this. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, it says, as a person thinks in his heart, so is he. That in other words, that you are your thoughts. Pastor Craig Groeschel puts it like this, that your life will always move in the direction of your strongest thoughts. And so here's the thing. If you always tell yourself that you can't do it, then guess what? Odds are that you probably won't be able to do it. And if you tell yourself that you're no good, then guess what? It's amazing how life will end up following the direction of your strongest thoughts. You know what I tell my children? I tell my children this. They say that I'm not good at math. And I say, if you say that you're not good at math, you're not going to be good at math. Here's what you've got to say. I'm getting better at math. I'm doing all that I can. I'm going to give it all that I got, and I'm just going to let the chips fall where they may. And if that's what we tell our children, then that's what we have to apply to our own lives as well. Let me tell you, if you tell yourself that you can do it, watch how you just might give yourself a puncher's chance of making it happen. If you tell yourself that there are opportunities out there, then guess what? You just might be able to find one. And if you tell yourself that God is with you, and if you tell yourself that God is for you, wait and see what happens after that. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says this, that you and I are not to conform to the pattern of this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And that's what we're going to do, God. We thank you, Lord, and we, we, we praise you, Father, that you have given us your word that is truth, Father, your word that is life, Father, your word that guides us. But Father, by faith, we must accept those words, we must receive those words, and we must believe those words. And we do that, Father, by allowing our mind to capture some of those thoughts, Father, that are only from the evil one, and to realign and to readjust, readjust our thinking so that it's in complete alignment with who you are and what you want us to be and what you want us to do. God, we love you so much. We thank you for today. We pray all of these things in your precious son's name and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. Why don't you all stand up with me? So I'll sing this song.
great I am, God. We thank you, Father. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for purpose, God. We thank you for being everything that we need, which means there's nothing that you're not. So, God, we tap into everything you need, whether that's healing, whether that's, Father, God, peace of mind, whether that's things at the house, with the family, with the job, whatever it is, God, you are, and because you are, we are, God. And so we bless you and we give you the praise, God. We pray that the word that was spoke, every song that was sing, Father God, rest, Father God, on our lives and become part of our living. Father God, not just that, not just for us, but Father, so that we can empower and so important to someone else, God. In Jesus' name we pray, we give you all the glory and honor. And everybody under the sound of my